Hello, I am Sarah Bates, NHGRI Communications Director here at NIH. I'm very delighted to introduce our very special guest today, Emily Grassley. So Emily Grassley is an artist, a science communicator, a writer, a video host, an educational video producer, and obviously, as you shall soon see, a style icon. <laughs> In 2013, Emily started as the first ever chief curiosity correspondent for the Field Museum in Chicago, creating more than 200 episodes on her YouTube channel, The Brain Scoop, which is a natural history themed channel whose videos have been downloaded tens of millions of times by people around the world. That was actually how I first became aware of Emily uh, when I watched her Brain Scoop video, Dissection of Bullet Ants. Uh, which is how I learned why their stings are so very painful. In 2020, Emily made her broadcast television debut on PBS for On Prehistoric Road Trip. If you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to do so. It's an extremely cool original three-part series which explores paleontology and natural history of the Dakotas, Montana, and Wyoming. Today, she continues to create videos for The Brain Scoop as an independent producer in partnership with scientists, nature centers, and museums around the country. Emily has received numerous accolades for her, war her work, including the American Alliance of Museums Nancy Hanks Award for Professional Excellence. She holds an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Allegheny College. And in 2018, researchers at the University of Florida and Piranha named a new species of butterfly in recognition of her efforts. I know the last name is Grassley. Well, Hydra Grassley. Please Google that and look that up. <laughs> Today, Emily will talk about the power of curiosity. And we're going to be accepting questions at the end. So please get your questions ready. If you're on Zoom, put them in the Q&A box. If you're here in the room, please line up at the microphones afterwards. I'm delighted to turn it over to Emily. Please welcome Emily Grassley. Hi, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to be here today. I think if you had gone back in time and told me 10 years ago that I would be standing in the place that Fauci was standing, I think I would say you don't know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, so thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I am excited to spend the next uh, 45 minutes or so bringing you all along my own educational and communication journey, some of the things I've learned along the way, um, and just stuff I'm excited to talk about. Um, so yeah, I'll just get into it. So the power of curiosity. Um, yeah, woo, here we are, woo. And I, talk titles are so hard, right? I'm like, you could, it could be anything. It could just be like, hear Emily Grassley talk. Um, but I, I love this talk title because it really does come down to like the, the power of asking that question, the power of being investigative and really where that can take you in your life. Um, so first and foremost, I get the question, where did I go to science school? And uh, I am really proud that I graduated from the University of Montana in 2011 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting and a minor in Art History. And I'm asked all the time how my creative artistic background comes into the work that I do as a science communicator. And I am genuine in what I say that I would not be able to do what I do had I not spent those formative years in art school learning how to communicate a really complex idea in an instant. So we talk about the science of science communication. There's also a science of museum studies. And what we learned in art school is that on average, you get about 15 seconds of attention per person visiting a gallery. So in 15 seconds, and imagine you go, you go to an art museum here, count in your head, how long do you spend looking at each thing of artwork? So in 15 seconds or less, you've got to com communicate a really complex idea to bring people in visually to um, whether it's the image or the title, any combination of things to grab their interest. Um, and so I uh, studied landscape painting primarily because I wanted to show that where I'm from is South Dakota a rural part of the country is still very much impacted by things like the environment and climate change. And we're also part of the country that most people probably don't think about, but I'm a 
you know, a descendant of farmers and ranchers. And I know that uh, a single storm could wipe out your entire, you know, uh, year's worth, your profit, your, what you would take to market. And so what is that, you know, the tenuousness of being on the edge and having your whole life's work tied up in, into the landscape? And so that's really what motivated me to study landscapes in the beginning. And I'm also asked, what do you do with your art degree now? And um, I have, I'm really proud that I've set up my own online store and I sell my original paintings. Um, and so I'm really able to still continue incorporating my uh, background as a visual artist into supporting myself making video work. So how did I go from studio art to uh, standing here today? Uh, it was this little mouse. This little mouse changed the world. I uh, was working as a barista in the campus convenience store my senior year of college and my friend Emily worked on the barista line with me and one day on Facebook she had posted a picture of her doing a dissection in the preparation lab in the campus uh, zoological museum. And that was the first time that I knew what a zoological museum was. I had no concept of what this was, how it was being used, what the history was. And so I asked her, like, could you take me and show me this place where you're doing, like, she wasn't just doing mouse dissections. She was, like, doing autopsies on, like, wolves for Montana Fish and Wildlife. She was taking in big skulls of bighorn sheep and preparing them to try and help wildlife managers better understand things like, you know, how a contagious respiratory illness was being transferred from domestic sheep to wild sheep. So this was a place where there was really interesting research going on. So anyway, she brought me to the prep lab and uh, she had given me a tour of the museum. She hands me this Ziploc bag and it's got a dead mouse in it with a label. And she said, would you like to prepare this for the collection? And I was like, I'm not, I, you know I'm not a scientist, right? You know I'm an art major. And she was mostly like, well, you're good with your hands. You're good at doing fine detail stuff. You've got great observational abilities. Uh, I think you'd be good at it. And so she walked me through the whole process, took a couple of hours, and I, I'm a little ADHD, but I was like so clued in. I went into this like flow state where I found myself asking these questions like, oh, I didn't know that's how your arm connected to your body. I didn't know that's what a heart looked like. I didn't know how to like spread out small and you know large intestines. And I was just like, I was exploring from the inside out. And I, I didn't allow myself to be grossed out because I was surrounded by people who weren't grossed out. Um, and at the end of it, you know, you have this label that tells you where the specimen came from. Um, and it, it's a little record and it goes into a drawer to be used for science going forward. And the coolest thing about it was that I got to sign my name on the label as the preparator. And I got like this bolt of energy because I was like, I've never felt this proud signing my name on a painting, but I'm like signing my name on this little dead mouse. Like I, this is an electric feeling. And then I also was like, there must be something mentally wrong with me. Um, turns out there is, but that's beside the point. Uh, so kind of from that moment on, I was like, I don't know what it's going to take, but I want to stay in this museum. I want to be involved in this work. I, I, didn't, I didn't do a bad job on the mouse. The mouse looks pretty decent, all things considered. Um, and so I started volunteering. At first I did a semester of scientific illustration, kind of self-led, and then after I graduated I continued volunteering, and mostly just trying to get the word out. And I started doing that first through a curated art show that I launched on the University of Monta uh, Montana campus and recruited some of my art school buddies to come and create artwork in the museum. I reached out to community members, artists in, the, in Missoula, and I curated this little exhibit um, called Aesthetic Taxonomy. So that was kind of my first um, foray in trying to communicate this complex work to the public. And after I'd been at the Field Museum for a while, or not at the Field Museum, after I'd been at the University of Montana for a while, I started a blog where I was posting pictures of what I was doing. Long story short is that blog caught the attention of Hank Green, who runs Crash Course SciShow, one of the most famous YouTube educators alive today. He happened to be in Missoula, and he saw my Tumblr. And he was like, that looks like a pretty cool place. Can I come visit? So I invited him in. We did a video. Within two weeks, he had gotten back to me and was like, do you want to have your own YouTube channel? So we started the Brain Scoop um, in, I don't know why these slides are backwards, but anyway, we started the Brain Scoop in um, January of 2014, and by April, the Field Museum had made me an offer to bring me and my new YouTube channel to Chicago. And so I went from 
working in a tiny collection that had 24,000 specimens and was very proud of working in there. Then I go to the Field Museum and they've got 30 million objects and artifacts and about 150 scientists on staff. So I was uh, out of my element, but when you're offered that kind of thing, it's like that Alexander Hamilton moment. You're like, I'm not giving up my shot. Like, <laughs> and uh, so I just head first went into it with the kind of knowledge and appreciation that as a non-scientist, I can be a fantastic proxy for the audience. Because most people aren't scientists, you know, and for any number of reasons, they don't feel it's accessible, they don't think they're interested in it. And so me, as an artist, and somebody who's just genuinely excited about stuff, was like, well, I'll just bring a camera in and show people the things that I see. And this is the sort of stuff that we would see, right, is pulling open drawers. Um, this is the Smithsonian. The Field Museum doesn't quite have these beautiful images, but this really gives you a, a sense of the depth and the diversity of stuff and the researchers who are working in museums. But one thing that was kind of important to me is that the work that we do isn't just dead stuff in drawers. It's not just something pretty to look at. It's not just things in natural history museums aren't necessarily made just for display, but who are the people looking at all these dead butterflies and parrots? Why do we even have them? Uh, aren't pictures enough? Doesn't CT scanning work? Let's take a picture and get rid of everything. Um, and one thing that I thought would be super interesting to share to this audience is that so much of the work that happens in natural history museums from a taxonomic perspective and understanding speciation comes from things that were developed um, through the Human Genome Project and through other, uh, a lot of medical research. So it's one of these like downstream impacts um, that has like this radiating in, uh, effect throughout the field of natural history. And some examples of how that information is used is asking questions like, where do turtles go? For a long time, researchers didn't know where in the tree of life turtles fit. There's a lot of hypotheses. There's a lot of like looking at records. But basically, nobody, nobody knew where turtles were supposed to be. And it was through um, ultra-conserved elements that they were able to kind of determine where everything sits in this, in the uh, tree of life. In addition, same sort of things, like how did freshwater fish get from Africa to, you know, the Caribbean islands or from um, uh, just within the Caribbean islands themselves? Did they swim across the ocean? I don't know. It's a theory. It is a theory. And it's, that is the sort of theory that's being tested. The salinity, how far these uh, freshwater fish can go, where they go into the um, salt water. So anyway, that's one example. And uh, another interesting way that um, this DNA, this genetic material is being used is for things like environmental DNA. And this, I love this graphic. This is a paper that just came out um, a couple of weeks ago. And it was a really cool study, a uh, postdoc at the Field Museum, Sophie, um, we call her uh, Spicy Q because that's what her um, email address is. It's S and then P-I-C-U at, at fieldmuseum.org. Anyway, so Sophie, um, <laughs> that was just a little fun fact, I don't know. <laughs> um, so Sophie led this research project where they took like a tiny water sample, went to a river in uh, Illinois, the Kankakee River, took the sample and extrapolated out of it what organisms were found in that river. And this is the circle of things that they found in just this small um, sample of water. And within this is, you know, you have interesting mammals, you have super interesting birds, obviously fish, but a lot of new ranges for certain species of fish that we didn't know were there, uh, rare species that we didn't know were there. Even interesting things like armadillos, are that far north in Illinois. So we know that armadillos' ranges are gradually moving north through climate change, but we didn't know yet that armadillos had already made it up to Kankakee, Illinois. And so here's a fantastic record, because who's gonna sit on the side of a river with binoculars looking for an armadillo? It's just not practical, right? So with new um, research, you're able to apply things outside of human health and interest and do so much more in the field of natural history. So anyway, Brain Scoop, I uh, launched the show, The Brain Scoop, and that is sort of the sort of, those examples are the sort of things that we would talk about in the show. Um, the Brain Scoop, it, we've made over 200 videos so far um, at not just the Field Museum, but lots of natural history museums. And uh, just a, an example of some of the wacky things that we have done, here's our most watched videos. So everything from anthropology, and uh, how did King Tut have a flat head? Did you know King Tut had a flathead? 
now you do. Don't you want to click the video? Um, so we talked to a biological anthropologist. Um, the bullet ant venom, that's a dissection, like a gut dissection. How do you do a dissection of an ant gut? And why would you even want to do that? But bullet ants are, you know, they have one of the most powerful, most painful stings in the animal kingdom. Why do they need that if they live in big colonies? Couldn't they have just 10% of that ferocity? How do we know that? How do we study it? Well, you've got to dissect their gut bacteria. And you know, so we went with an entomologist who could show that. Um, and then stuff at Montana, like skinning the wolf. Why did we get a big wolf to necropsy from fish and wildlife? These are big wildlife bio questions that are being answered in places like Montana. So that's just a random selection of stuff. Uh, video where my ladies at was about uh, lack of you know diverse representation for creators, female creators, and um, uh, people who don't identify being women on the platform because representation in science is a, is a huge ongoing thing. And to that point, um, when you think about natural history museums, you think maybe about the sort of work that we do. Um, I like to start on the public side of things. Most people, when you go to a museum, you're familiar with an exhibit, but these exhibits are only showing less than 1% of all the objects that are within that museum. It's a tiny, tiny fraction. And yet, there is still so much history within the exhibits themselves. And a lot of this research is still being done, not just on the science side, but also on the exhibition side. So for example, years ago, I was looking through the Field Museum archives, came across this picture, and my question was, how did an African-American man in Chicago get hired as an artist in the Field Museum in the 50s and 60s? Like how? Where did he come from? Who t trained him? You know, all of these questions where you're know, like, who is this man, Carl Cotton? And so people in exhibitions started do digging, doing some research, trying to find more about this man who worked for the museum for 40 or 50 years, ended up finding his family through social media, and they came to the museum and we co-curated an exhibit together. And they were able to see more of the work of, of um, you know, their father, their grandfather, their uncle, and we were able to preserve um, this sort of story and put it on the channel because this was a temporary exhibit, uh, but now the video will live on the channel. Uh, we also bring people behind the scenes to show the sort of work uh, that we're doing in the collections and just some of the collections themselves. Like the Field Museum has one of the biggest collections of eggs in the world. And because of the Migratory Bird Species Act of 1928, uh, fact check me on that, um, you can no longer collect any bird remnants, no feathers, no nests, and no eggs. So this collection of eggs that goes from you know, the mid 1800s to you know, early 1900s, this is a collection you cannot recreate. You cannot, like legally it is not possible. And yet we know you can extract DNA from old stuff and so they're still able to take bits of the shells and uh, one of the coolest ways that this collection was used was to implement protections for raptors through detection of DDT. So DDT, the pesticide, was being used widely across the United States. And it, then with, coinciding with that, we were having a huge decline of raptors. So eagles, hawks, um, osprey, you know, any, any sort of raptor animal. And uh, it was by looking at collections like this where scientists were looking at the thickness of the eggshell and were learning that with the use of DDT, there wasn't enough like calcium to make the eggs rigid enough to protect the, the baby bird. And so they were the birds were just sitting on their nests and squashing all the babies. So it was by looking at collections, being able to see here's the, the width of an eggshell today versus what it used to be 100 years ago identified DDT as the problem and now you can't use DDT anymore. And it was because of the Field Museum egg collection that, that part of that was possible. But beyond the work that's happening you know, in exhibits, in collections, we also have a lot of work that's happening um, in the field that just doesn't get as much attention. And so we did a video with um, Dr. Leslie D'Souza, who is a phenomenal ichthyologist, conservation scientist. She's literally friends with the president of Guyana. Like, she, he calls on her to help um, him better understand sort of the policy for navigating and protecting these waters, for protecting fish like arapaima that migrate. I didn't know fish migrated. Um, but if they live in a certain part of the river most of the year and you're only protecting that part of the river, then you're not thinking about literally the downstream impacts of that. So there's a lot of cool research like that happening. So that's sort of the stuff that I did with BrainScoop. 
talk a little bit more, um, talk a little bit about the PBS series that I developed starting in 2018, and then a lot of the things that I have learned from both the PBS series as well as Brain Scoop. So, long story short, in 2018, I was approached by somebody on the executive team at WTTW, which is Chicago's public TV program and or station. And they came to me and they're like, we really love what you do. The Field Museum is great. I think it would be awesome to develop a partnership where you could like, basically he asked me, have you ever thought about hosting your own like hour long TV show? And when somebody asks you that question, you say yes, <laughs> even if the answer is no. So I said, yeah, that would be great. And he's like, what have you thought about? So the thing that had been in my mind at that time was we were renovating the um, Evolving Planet exhibit at the Field Museum to put Sue, the T-Rex, into a brand new display area. Sue, when they were discovered in 1990, 1991, was the largest and most complete Tyrannosaurus Rex fossil ever discovered. And the really cool thing about Sue, as I had mentioned earlier, I'm uh, from a family of farmers and ranchers, Sue's skeleton was found five miles off of my family's ranch land in Faith, South Dakota. So growing up as a kid in the 90s, my grandfather and my father were huge Sioux fans because who has heard of Faith, South Dakota, <laughs> except for in, con in you know, connection with Sue? So I, you know, to the point where like when I got hired at the Field Museum, my grandfather was in assisted living. He may have been in hospice, and I told him the Field Museum hired me to uh, take care of Sue and make sure Sue was being cared for by a South Dakota girl. And uh, so just to show you a little bit of that connection there. So anyway, Sue was getting all this attention, and I brought this up. I was like, wouldn't it be cool to go to a place like South Dakota that has such a rich fossil record? You can start at Mount Rushmore. Those are some of the oldest rocks in the United States. I think they're like 3.2 billion years old. You can go to the place where Sue was discovered. That's 65 million years. And then you can go to the Badlands National Park, and they have fossils that are between 40 and 56 million years. I was like, wouldn't that be a cool hour-long special? Drive through South Dakota, stop at these sites, and that would be great. He's like, that sounds awesome. Let's pitch it to PBS <laughs> National. And so we did. It was one of those 15-minute meetings where I came, and I was flabbergasted. I was flubbing. I was like, I like dinosaurs. I don't know. I think this would be cool. And they were like, you don't have to sell us. The only th problems with your idea is that if it's going to be a national show, you can't just film in South Dakota. And one hour is not going to be enough. So we would like a revised proposal, three-hour show, and expand it across a state. Okie dokie. Uh, so that's how we came up with prehistoric road trip. And one of the things that I think was really important for me going into this is I hear this a lot from scientists, from um, members of the public. It comes down to like, what are we going to do to fight misinformation? Like, what are we going to do to combat, you know, all of this stuff? And it really puts like science uh, on the defensive. And I don't think that's a very uh, effective communication strategy. You can't come in hot to somebody who doesn't know anything and they are being confronted with maybe somebody with a PhD. There's just the, the relationship gap is too great. You got to meet people where they're coming from. And you can't do it as a way that's like pandering or that you're trying to exploit this sort of difference. But one of the key principles that I think in my, I, I think of is this idea of uh, psychological reactance or the boomerang effect. And this is essentially like COVID-19 is a fantastic example. You have all the research, you have all the science, you, you know what's going to help, and yet we run into so many communities that are just in, incredibly, res incredibly resistant from the very beginning. And part of that is because science communicators aren't thinking of this principle of reactance, where if you dig down, the more facts I throw at you, like, you know, the masks are important, we need to social distance, we have to do this. Like, you're, you're telling somebody what they want, to, they don't want to do it for any number of reasons, and it's more impactful for you to figure out what those reasons are, and then to change your strategy. Not to convince that person, but to better your own technique for taking anything like that to any kind of audience, regardless. So one thing that I think made me unique, uniquely qualified for doing prehistoric road trip is, again, I am from this part of the country. I am from a part of the country that is wildly underserved by science and science education. 
a part of the country that's very rural, um, people who have, uh, who just cannot relate to anybody on either coast. They've been misrepresented, they've been, uh, yeah, in general, lots of preconceptions uh, why they may not think that science is for them. And so I was like, let's focus on this chunk of the country because we can hit representation on so many different fronts and try to include so many different perspectives to round out this idea that science is a thing for everybody. There's, I don't care who you are, there's some entry point that you can have uh, into the work. And so we had a three hour special and this is how we broke it down into this gigantic road trip. The first hour was even just how to begin understanding the geologic time scale. If I'm talking about the age of the earth, which is very convenient, 4.567 billion years old, Nobody knows what that is. Paleontologists don't even know what that is. It's just such a huge amount of time. How do we go from you know, having some of the oldest rocks in the country to bridging a gap between you know, 2.1 billion years to 145 million years? And so one of the challenges in that is not losing your audience. Like I can't just go and spend the first hour of my three hour series talking about like the driest you know, geology lesson. We've got to start you know, at the very beginning and then go into action and go find these different people. So, you know, we started talking about rocks, but then we quickly went to like the Casper Community College and interviewed people there who were doing fossil excavations. Um, so that was the first episode. Just trying to wrap your head around like what we mean by deep time. The second episode was taking that concept and just squishing it to only, only focus on two million years. So the last two million years, of the Cretaceous period, right, where the dinosaurs were thriving and then before they all went extinct. What do we find in the fossil record in this part of the country that helps us um, put together that, that picture of dinosaur extinction? How do we know what lived before and how do we know how, what came after? So we were just kind of focusing on that part of it and not just focusing on dinosaurs, but also going to a place like Hell Creek State Park where we talked to a clam scientist who studies fossil clams. And I guarantee if you watch Prehistoric Road Trip, you will be team fossil clam by the end of it. <laughs> because they're, what they're able to do is like take these samples from the shells and dissolve them into acid and try to figure out like what the um, water conditions were while those clams were living, not just um, during, the time of the dinosaurs, but how they were able to persist through the extinction event. Because in places like where we were, here's a map, it's a great one. Um, this is basically our, our collective road trip. It's 2,000 miles if you started in Rapid City and did the whole loop. We drove 6,000 miles to film the show. Um, but this is kind of what we wanted to capture is you could drive through this entire thing um, uh, over time. So I didn't mention the, the third episode as looking sort of the rise of the mammals, but then also the history of the field of paleontology. So instead of just going right down into like ancient time, ancient organisms, and looking more about like, who's doing science today in the field? Uh, what are some of the, uh, you know, some of the challenges like in terms of land ownership, fossil acquisition, uh, some of those boring, maybe boring legal things that actually ended up being and are really relevant. Uh, to discussion. So I really like this map because it shows you the cluster of breakdown. So all of the stuff in the first episode, this was all the, the really old stuff, uh, is the dinosaurs. The blue dots are all of the um, Cretaceous age material, and then this is all the younger stuff. So just visually, you can even see how the road trip itself broke down into different sites. Um, one of the things I think that makes this show so incredibly effective, it is, it's because it is the most diverse paleo program ever. And that's not just in the representation of people on screen, but also in the representation of different organizations. So coming from a non-science background, I wanted to go to the places that I felt I could relate most with people. And that starts at areas like community colleges. What, what is a place like Casper Community College? Um, what role do they have in the field of paleontology, for example? Uh, we worked with tribal museums and colleges, regional, private, state, federal government, basically anybody whose work touches paleontology or land ownership and management was somebody who we wanted to include in the show. 
So I mentioned Casper Community College. Uh, a lot of people probably don't think of community colleges as being huge contributors to fields of research and science. People are also probably not thinking of Wyoming as contributing to a lot of the field of science. But the folks at Casper Community College have been working in the same fossil beds as the first paleontologists in the country. So we were out there, um, uh, Medicine Bow Mountains-ish area. Um, I can't, don't, I need to rewatch the show. I don't remember all the details. Uh, but anyway, so this is where, you know, talk about the bone wars between Marsh and Cope in the early 1900s. These are when paleontologists went out there and they were just like digging everything up and like trying to make fake dinosaurs out of a bunch of different bones and out publish one another. And so anyway, the, these are the same bone beds that they were extracting dinosaurs from. And we know with like new, uh, new comparative uh, abilities to look at these fossils and compare them to ones that Marsh and Cope collected that are now at Yale or the Field Museum, a lot of these are still housed in Casper. So you have Field Museum researchers who got to go to Casper. And I think that is so cool. Um, another, so this was episode two. Uh, episode two, we got to do some of that like on the ground research short of work with those scientists. And I just love this example because we did not expect this to happen. Uh, you can't plan for this. So anyway, we were in uh, Hill Creek State Park with some folks from the Royal Ontario Museum. And planning prehistoric road trip took a year and a half. So we were working with these scientists with the community colleges so much back and forth to make everything work because we had to film at 34 sites in nine weeks and like nothing could go wrong. So when we reached out to people at the ROM who had been working in these same areas for a long time, we were like, we have a film crew, we'd love to come out, and is there any field work that you're doing that we could film? And there was like, well, we maybe found something, but I don't, it, we can't promise anything. It might just be one bone. Basically, one of the researchers was uh, taking a stroll, last classic story, last day, last few hours of the last day of field work for the season, walked down this ravine and saw what ended up being the occipital condyle. So the big like ball joint that holds the, the skull onto your spine, just sitting out, eroding from the side of this mountain. And it's very obvious because you have like dirt and then this huge ball of fossil. And so they put a little jacket over it, pilaster jacket, and decided to come back next year. So that's when they were like, you can come, but it might just be like one bone. It was not one bone. It was the entire skull of the Triceratops. And so while we are filming that day, we are uncovering the side of the face of this Triceratops, being the first people ever to see this. It's the first time that this or animal that's been in the ground 65 million years, and we were able to unearth it on camera and capture the excitement of the scientists and cap like just them getting so giddy about it. And like you really see their passion come through. So that, I mean, you can't ask for better TV than that. Uh, for the third episode, I, as I mentioned, we wanted to bring it, you know, from that period, after the dinosaurs get wiped out, how did mammals survive and what happened to life after that? We also started to get into, and this is where I wanted to bring the show to apply it to contemporary ideas. Because often when we think about paleontology, you're just thinking about dinosaurs and you're like, that seems superf superfluous. Like, why do we care? about a triceratops. It's not gonna help advance science. It's not gonna help us cure cancer. It's not gonna, you know, all of these things, it feels like more resources ought to be going to more important science. And I'm doing big air quotes. Um, and one of the stories that we ended up featuring that I think is such a brilliant one for the show is working with this um, fantastic group of collaborators based out of, um, the University of Wyoming and also one of is a, is a UGS scientist and what they're studying is a climate change event that happened about 56 million years ago. And it is the closest analogy for the same kind of climate change that we're expecting today in terms of the CO levels going up in the atmosphere. And I, I can't exactly remember the conclusion we came to. Again, I, I haven't watched the show since it broadcast because I don't like watching videos of myself. But um, it was this spike, this huge spike in CO levels. And so you're able to see the, the immediate like extinction in this area of everything that kind of dropped off. And they're able to see the downstream impacts of what it means to have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The scary thing 
is that what happened during the PETM that contributed, it was like the biggest extinction of organisms since the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs. And this happened over a period of about 150,000 years. And the same levels of CO2 that we're dealing with today is happening on a, a scale of about 100 years. So what are we learning from something that played out over 150,000 years? That gives us a preview for what we can expect today. So that's a really, really clear example of studying fossils and the fossil record can help us better understand the kind of uh, things that are happening on our planet. Because often, and I think this is also an American thing, we don't have a good sense of time. We're thinking about uh, on a period of generations, three, maybe four generations ago. I mean, can any of you name your fifth generation person, six, seven, eight? We just don't have a good concept of time or deep time. We're thinking about it on a scale of 200 years. So it, this is just a really great example of showing like the world is dynamic and things can recover, but it's important to think about that this is happening on such a more condensed time scale. One other thing that um, I want to mention too, and I think is probably the most critical part of the show, the thing I cared the most about including, and the thing that I have never seen covered before, which is the, um, the, uh, the uh, removal of fossil material from tribal lands. Um, I don't want to call it deaccessioning. That's not the right word. But it's basically fossil theft. And so when you think about, again, I showed you the map at the, in the beginning, that big circle overlaps so many um, tribal communities and reservation communities in the country. And when you think about the history of paleontology, do you think any of those paleontologists cared to go to these, com these you know, tribal communities and request permission? No, they just would go and steal fossils indiscriminately. And you might not think it's a really important thing or a big deal. It's a big deal for a lot of reasons. It's a big deal because it's cultural material. It's oftentimes sacred material. Also, it's a, just a valuable um, resource like water, like um, trees, any sort of re resource that's being plundered from native lands. You can put fossils in with that group. In addition to that, fossils have a major, major monetary um, potential monetary association. When Sue the T-Rex went up to auction, I think it was a uh, $9 million uh, sale, $13 million overall. Who's getting those $13 million? It's not the Cheyenne River Reservation where Sue was excavated. None of that money went back to the Cheyenne people. And that is, that's wrong. That's not okay. And I had never seen that talked about. And I think part of it is because you've got paleontologists who helicopter in to these areas. They only think of places like flyover states or areas that have a resource to be exploited. And yet, who has gone to these native communities to ask for their consent? Dr. Lawrence Bradley, um, I'm incredibly grateful for his participation. And a lot of what I'm telling you, I would not know any of this without his PhD dissertation that I found. And I'll, I remember reading it, and it's called The Fossils and Indians, and, or Dinosaurs and Indians. And I highly recommend, it, even for being a PhD dissertation, it's incredibly accessible. And what he essentially did, um, he was kicked out, he wasn't allowed into a paleo program at University of Nebraska, so he ended up studying geology. And then, uh, so that's a little bit of uh, institutional racism, not just a little bit. It's his whole career trajectory has been trying to take his research, which is going to museum collections, opening drawers, and just looking at the geo information and saying, this was stolen from native lands. This was stolen from native lands. You do that in one collection, collections don't want you to come into there. So he, with the door slammed in his face. Nobody wanted him to do this research. And that, that's incredibly problematic. And I wanted to, if I was going to use the platform for anything, it would be to highlight underrepresented voices like Dr. Bradley's and what he represents in terms of native science. And because of, because of his work, you now have a lot more of those considerations of repatriation of fossil materials. And like that is the, that is the hill that I will die on in terms of like we cannot commodify aspects of nature because it gives people the wrong impression that it is. Uh, just a resource, and it's not. So anyway, 
If you want to watch Prehistoric Road Trip, which you absolutely should, uh, you can stream it on WTTW's website. I didn't include a slide in here, but we also, uh, PBS Learning Media has created an entire suite of educational materials that fall, you know, next generation science standards, all these other great lesson plans. So if you are interested in any of this or have a child or anybody who might be doing some of this science work, if you got a kid who's in school, tell them to watch Prehistoric Road Trip because it really is one of the most diverse paleo shows. Um, we have more people of color and women represented in, than any other channel or show I've seen. So. That's what I care about. I care about bringing my platform as a non-scientist to help highlight the stories of people that don't have that kind of audience or the skills to get it out into the world. Um, I really think of my, my work as uh, I'm a conduit for the audience. I am coming into these stories and using my camera and sharing it with the rest of the world. So that's my presentation. That was it. And I think we have a little extra time for questions, which is my favorite part. I'd rather talk to you than hear myself talk. So anyway, uh, yeah, here's my acknowledgement slide. So thank you. I couldn't do this show without all these people. Hooray. There we go. That was an incredible talk. Uh, I'm obsessed. Thank you so much. If you have questions, please come to the microphone in the room. If you're watching online, please put your questions into the Zoom Q&A. Um, and we already have one question right here. Yeah, another shy person. Eric Green. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, that was wonderful. Thank um, you. You are obviously at a, a, a mecca of biomedicine, whereas a lot of your previous work has been in other areas of sciences. I, don't, I didn't look at all of your 200 and something videos. What? But I looked at most of them. Um, not a lot on, I mean, biomedicine would be new. I mean, yeah. somewhat new for you. And telling, it's one thing to talk about dinosaurs, but mm -hmm. talking about human disease, human genomics, some of these other things. Have, have, it's a little, little bit, it's a, it'll, it'll require a different style. It's one yes. of the reasons you're here is to talk to us about that. Have you thought about that very much, about sort of, um, you, there's not the immediacy, it's, it's obvious why it's relevant to people. You, yeah. you have maybe a few more steps to explain why all the fish in some river mm -hmm. are relevant. But have you thought about how you might have to use your skills a little bit differently in telling something that's so immediate to, to somebody? Yeah. I mean, it's a whole other level of like emotional investment and involvement and that sort of thing. If you're talking about biomedical communication, it feels like the stakes are a lot higher in terms of the communication output um, or the goals of that communication. So like when we make brain scoop, oftentimes the goal was to just show what an entomologist is, the kind of work that they do um, to get that better appreciation. Um, for just understanding who scientists are and the representation themselves, but not necessarily uh, like we want them to take away this learning point from the video. For something like biomedical, stakes are a lot higher, right? There's a lot more people who are invested and interested. There's a, perhaps a lot of competing agendas, and as a science communicator, it is my job to absorb all of that. I absorb the impact and the feedback from people. I very rarely come into a place, or I try not to, and be like, I think this is what you guys should do. I'm more, I try to show up to a place and be like, what do you care about? What matters to you? Where is the hole that you would like to see filled? Um, and can I bring my audience to do that? Is that going to be in line? And the great thing about the Brain Scoop audience is that they're just excited about anything. The biggest criticism we get is that we don't post enough videos. You know, and so people are just primed and they're ready to absorb anything. And one of my greatest pieces of feedback that I get, and I get it often, thankfully, is just people saying, I didn't even know I cared about this. And so just igniting that sense of passion, even if it's not like they walk away with a, I understand the COVID vaccine. Like maybe they just want to know who's developing it or what the NIH is. Maybe they don't even know. Hello, how's it going? I'm fantastic, how are you? Nice, I am too. Uh, so my name is E.B., I'm a post uh research fellow at the NIH, and I've been a fan of you for many years, like uh, not to age your show, but since high school. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I feel very privileged that I've been able to do this that long. Yeah, so they, they've, your videos have always been like very inspiring for me, and I get so excited when one would come out. I'm like, oh my god, what has come out? Like, I'm so excited about it. 
Um, so one of the things that I appreciate about your videos is you ask really good questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask, like, how do you ask really good questions, especially like for scientists or if you're interviewing a scientist, like how do you come up with questions that are very intriguing or like continue the conversation? Like I wanted yeah. to ask about that. That's a great question. Um, I have realized that one of my best assets is that I'm just a busybody. I'm just really nosy, you know? And I, I have become less ashamed of asking any of those questions. Um, I try to think about who is behind the camera. And w people ask, like, how are, you, how are you not afraid of the camera? And I will tell you, and she might not be watching, but my sister, Siri, I, my, it is my goal in life to entertain her. And to, you know, if anybody's a younger sibling, don't you just wanna you know, be cool to your older sibling? So I feel like when I'm doing videos, I'm thinking of her behind the camera. And I know she's, she's interested, she's smart, but she doesn't know any of this stuff. So how would I engage in a conversation with her? And you try to do it conversationally. So instead of thinking about an interview like, I'm gonna stand up and start the interview. You know, it's more like uh, one of the things I do before we um, begin rolling is I just kind of show up to the person and I start asking them questions that don't have anything to do with the interview because I'll blow the interview. Like I can't ask them the good question ahead of the interview before the, the um, cameras are rolling. So for instance, I just interviewed a guy at Indiana Dunes. He's a National Park uh, Service person. And the question I first asked him, I was like, did you always wanted to be a scientist? And he's like, no, I, I really just wanted to work in a cubicle. <laughs> and so I was like, I didn't, I, just, I didn't ask him anything else. I just clocked it in my head. So when we're doing the interview, I know to ask that question because I know what he's gonna say and it's a fantastic answer. And it's, it seems like low hanging fruit. You're like, have you always wanted to be a scientist? No, I grew up wanting to work in an office. I wanted to work in a cubicle. And when I got that job, I decided I hated it. It wasn't for me, and I changed my life career. How relatable is that? How relatable is it to have a dream that you want, that you work hard for, no matter what the dream is? It could be working in a cubicle. It could be whatever. And to know that you've pursued that passion, you've invested yourself, and then you're, you know yourself well enough to be like, it wasn't for me and then to pivot. And I think that sort of thing makes for a good question because it's a relatable answer. And so I kind of am trying to think of the answer I'm trying to get at, and I ask the question to get that answer. Nice. One of the things, too, I think um, I come in as like a non-scientist, but I do a tremendous amount of pre-production work to the point where I think most scientists don't know that I've read a ton of their papers. And I, so I come in, and I, I just know I just know what they do, and it's a little bit easier to get them rolling um, on the questions. But I'll, it's just about it's just about developing a relationship. That was one of the greatest things about the Field Museum is I could walk down the hall and walk into somebody's office, and they might be annoyed by me the first four times I stroll in, but maybe not number five. You know, yeah. maybe number five is when they pop open the drawer and they're like, you know, I've not felt appreciated for my work. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What do you, what do you want people to know? Yeah. And then they start asking, like, God, oh, I would like people to know this. They get more excited. I get more excited. And yeah. you have a brain scoop video. Yeah, the people at the Field Museum are so nice. Like, I used to volunteer there, so yeah. it's, it's, they're great. Yeah. But yeah, thank you. Of course. Thanks for watching. Hi, Emily. My Hi. name's Gabrielle. I am another Brain Scoop fan since high school. <laughs> um, and I come from an arts background, now working in communications at a very sciencey place. And I know intrinsically how valuable the arts and creativity are for communicating science. I frequently run into scientists who are really skeptical about that, though, and don't see how the arts can help their goals and get the word out about what they're doing. Do you have any advice for working with people who are skeptical about how the arts and creative expression can help them out and fit into their science work? I'm just as much of an expert at my field as they are to theirs. And so I don't forget that. And I know my value, I know what I bring. And if somebody else doesn't value that, I'm not gonna waste my energy. You know, I have plenty of other things that I could go talk about, places that I could go and things that I could do. So that's the beauty of um, what I do as a contractor um, and as an independent producer now. You may not have that luxury, um, and I, I appreciate it. And I think it's just, 
part of it might come down to pitching that what you are doing is, is in service of what they do. And um, I think one of the biggest grievances of scientists is just that nobody, nobody knows what I do and nobody cares. And it's just hitting them over the head many times being like, what do you care about? What do we want people to know? And the more that you can develop that relationship with those people, like I said, it's just they might hate you coming in their office four times, but maybe the fifth they won't. Um, and it just, you kind of have to put your own ego um, in the back seat and be aware enough and, and to just sort of, I don't know, it's like be, be a rubber band, like be a rubber wall, not a brick wall where things hit you, they don't just sit at your feet and you know, you gotta kick the dirt out of the way. Like if people throw hate or insecurities at you, you're just like, I'm just, I know you, I know it's a you problem, not a me problem. Um, and I can thank uh, four years of therapy for that. So <laughs> honestly, honestly, it really, self-awareness is such a gift in this field. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Theo Tiffany. I'm one of the communications specialists at NHGRI, and I have a very silly question for you. I love silly questions. Which is, from my college experiences working in collections, I learned that things can sometimes get kind of pungent in there. Oof, yeah. So, what is the worst smell you've encountered, and what is the most memorable smell you've encountered? <laughs> I'm very smell oriented in my show. Like you will watch me sniff. I, we're editing the, we did a rat dissection video recently where it's gonna be out next week. And there's a scene where I just pick it up and I'm just, and I'm like, why did I do that? I didn't even know I was like, afterwards I was like, I'm so gross, why do I do that? Um, the worst thing I probably have smelled, oh man, if a freezer goes out, that's, that was one of the worst. When I was a volunteer at the University of Montana, um, it, classic three day weekend thing. There was a, uh, on a Friday, a student in wildlife bio unplugged to the freezer to plug in a microscope, didn't realize it. You know, so I get to the prep lab on Tuesday morning and I'm like, I think the bathroom's backed up. Like, I think there's, I think I'm gonna call janitorial services or something. It just kept getting worse and worse. I was in the prep lab and then I look up and um, an or ornithologist, also named Eric Green, um, is running down the hallway and he's got two big bags of just dripping wet raptors. And he was like, I need freezer space. And I was like, I don't have any. And it was awful because then the next like two weeks I had to do mad prep and try to salvage these raptors that were part of his like flight program and his research specimens he'd been collecting for 20 years. So yeah, I had a bunch of bags of rotten 20 year old eagles on my hand. That was pretty awful. Um, most memorable smell experience. We did a dissection with uh, a mammologist named Dr. Or Adam Ferguson and he studies skunks. And I was like, why aren't there more skunk researchers? He's like, have you, you know you have to go catch them, right? In the wild. <laughs> um, and so I had heard, and ha heard, and you know it's true. There was, uh, skunk dissections are so hard because um, in this little biology lesson, they're mustelids, they're in the mustel mustely family. And they, their scent glands are on their anus, you know, and they are between a really thin layer of muscle. So it's like you have a muscle and then you have this anal sac, which is the size of a ping pong ball. And that's what the smell is in. So you've got a little bit of muscle, just a tiny piece of muscle, then you've got this sac and then you've got muscle behind it. And so it sprays because that's how they are able to spray their horrible demon spawn <laughs> squirt, whatever, I don't know what you call it. Um, because they contract that muscle. And so the most, it's the most stressful dissection I've ever done. Cause you get on the back end and the scalpel is so sharp and that muscle layer is so thin. <laughs> And it was like one of these things where I'm like, I don't know if we're gonna have to evacuate the museum. And one time they almost had to, there was a, someone who was doing a skunk dissection and they were doing a training and the, one of the anal sacs popped and so they tried to throw it into the mammal freezer, but then th that didn't kill the smell. So now every time someone opens the mammal freezer <laughs> at the field museum, you can smell the skunk that went wrong 10 years ago. Um, but anyway, that was a pretty gross one. The worst thing about it is that you could taste it. Oh. It was so strong, just being the odor in the air. You know, when you like, 
when you're um, cooking hot peppers and you walk into a kitchen and your eyes kind of burn. That, <laughs> that, my eyes were burning from skunk butt smell. <laughs> I'm a professional. <laughs> I am so glad I asked that question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi there, um, my name is Elizabeth. I'm in communications at NIAID, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Cool. Um, I had, I want to return to something that you mentioned earlier about your audience just being willing to follow you almost anywhere because they're curious. Mm -hmm. That's something that has always fascinated me about the Brain Scoop. I've been a fan, not quite since high school, but for quite a long time. Um, the sheer diversity of topics that you're able to explore while still maintaining that audience. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how to find that audience and attract that audience who are willing to jump from across a huge diversity of topics which may be only tangentially be related because they're all kind of lumped under the broad category of natural history, which is huge. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find those people and get them interested enough in your channel to, that they'll be willing to follow you wherever you want to go. Well, the cool thing is you don't have to find them. They'll find you. So um, just by providing the material out there um, and then knowing, like, who is the audience? Who, like, you have to be clear about identifying what that target is. Like, is it non-scientists? Is it a certain demographic of people, certain age? And those things are critical to keep in mind. So I spend a lot of time looking on the back end of the analytics of our show and looking at, I mean, you want to talk about the science of science communication. I'm there looking at how many girls between the age of, you know, 13 and 17 are watching this part of a video for how long in South Dakota. You know, so you can get that granular. Thanks, Google, uh, because of the analytics. So you can use that. It can either be completely overwhelming or you can use that as a good basis for change or maintenance. Um, I love the audience that we've collected. I am very proud of the fact that we have almost gender parity, almost 50-50 uh, women and men watching and based on YouTube's binary gender construct. Um, and so that's something I want to foster. And I don't know why I've ended up that way. I think it's, pro it's probably also because of the representation. Like I am always doing things outside of my comfort zone. And I think that's really inspirational to people, especially to women and girls who have so often been taught directly or indirectly that science isn't for them. They're not smart enough. They're not good enough. Um, and to see those people and to identify like, I'm making this for you. You can do this. This is for you. I mean, people have been watching me since high school. And I think they're probably the better people to ask this question. Honestly, I don't know. I, my, I struggle with mental health a lot, and imposter syndrome is horrible. It's horrible. It doesn't matter how many things you've accomplished. The more I've accomplished, the more of an imposter I feel like. You know, it's almost like I've faked it all the way to the top. Um, and... So it, it, you really need to kind of step back and maybe throw that question to other people and not be so, I can't, I can't dissect myself that much. I just kind of have to keep doing what I'm doing and, and people will follow along. But I don't know, it's a, it's a hard question to answer. I remember your uh, Where My Lady's At video very vividly. That was, that, that, that changed me as well. So I can see where you're getting at with that. So. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, Representation in science is so critical. And it's not just you know women on YouTube. I mean, I'm a white woman. I'm still coming from an incredibly privileged background. Um, and that's why you know representation is looking out across the world and seeing there is a gap there. There is a hole there. And I can't fill all of those holes. For instance, I got invited to be a speaker at like a STEM day for a school on Chicago's South Side in Englewood. And I was evaluating, they had a science fair and they had posters up. For one thing, it was an after school program and not a parent showed up to this. And they have work, they have other, they have so many other things that they're doing. We have these middle school kids who spent an entire semester on their science projects and so I showed up and I wanted to give everyone individual feedback and all the posters were about food deserts and you know, we live in a food desert. What does it mean for me to live in a food desert? What does it mean for my family? 
you know, why do we have higher rates of diabetes and cancer and why like malnutrition? And I'm a privileged white woman standing there giving them feedback. I, I could not possibly relate to these students. But they need representation. They need somebody who they can look to and be like, that person understands me. That person understands where I'm coming from. So I can reach curious people of all ages and types and backgrounds, but I might not be able to be the appropriate person to reach those specific targeted groups. Um, and that's the, that's the really frustrating part about a lack of representation on YouTube still. I've been doing this for over, my first YouTube video was 2012, so 12 years now, and it, it is heartbreaking to look out at the climate of diverse female non-binary creators in the sciences and still see that it really hasn't changed. I'm still talking to the same women and girls for 10 years ago, and we're in a discord, and every day we cry about not being able to get enough work and talking about how we see our male counterparts and just like accelerating. I mean, wouldn't it be cool to have a, a, a female Mark Rober and not to have to say the female Mark Rober? Wouldn't it be great to just have the male Mark Rober, you know, versus like a woman doing the same sort of thing without her gender or background being the primary pitch? So we're still so far behind. And again, if you look out at women making channels, we're all white, white women, or in the United States, not necessarily even from you know, underrepresented countries. And it's just unacceptable. I mean, with so many resources in the world, and everybody talks about the value of science communication, and you just don't see the downstream impact when it comes to independent contractors and freelancers like me. I, had, I was the chief curiosity correspondent for the Field Museum for seven years, and I was still the only person I knew who had a full-time salary job doing what I was doing. It is appalling to me when you look at other museums or any sort of science organization that set, puts such a premium value on SciComm and then gives it this much of a budget. You know, so it's, yeah. It's really, that gets really frustrating. I don't know, I lost the question. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more. Oh, sorry. No, that was a great question. And you did a great answer. <laughs> sorry. Scoop by. So sorry. Thank you so much. This is an incredible talk. Um, I don't want to rank things, but one of the things that I found the most interesting about it is how you set up the second half with a, like a little note about misinformation. Mm -hmm. so we're doing a lot of talking about misinformation right now, especially in DC. Um, so I think that the second half of the talk kind of offered your account of misinformation, but I just I wanted to hear more about why it was so clarifying to you to kind of use that as the framework. Like, that's not the problem we're trying to solve, but maybe can you help us understand like what, what is or what's the framework or maybe how should we think about, okay, there's this problem out there. Like, what is, how should we think about the problem so that we maybe could actually solve it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't like, I don't, and I know we're moving away from the term of misinformation, but it comes from a, it comes from that stance of like, I've got a fact, and this fact is fact, this fact is right, there is no right or wrong to this, it's unobjective. There's nothing in life like that. Um, when I go to, when I went to like a, for instance, a private landowner in Montana who wanted to um, film, you know, a, a fossil dig on their property, they're coming to it from like, why do you want to exploit me more? Like, I've already, I've already contributed my science. I've already let all these other researchers here. Now you're going to bring a film crew, and that's going to bring so much more attention. And do they care about the community? And we don't want tourism. We, you know, our values are being threatened. And you got to put all of your preconceived ideas. you got to set it all. Leave it at the door. Leave it at the door and come in and just ask them what they're, what, what do you care about? What are your values? Um, their values may not be science, and that's okay. Scientists so struggle with the sense of intellectual and moral superiority, and I think that is the, the most devastating part. I think it, it's, it comes down to people asking and being surprised all the time that I'm a science major. That to me is a slap in the face that you already think I'm unqualified to do this work, and yet here I am standing and talking to an audience of people online, I'm talking to people at NIH, why do I still feel like I need to defend my background as an artist? And so that's something that no scientist really brings to me as like, a, that's an asset, that's something we can use. They're like, that's a deficit. You would be better at this if you knew more about science. And so um, 
yeah, I don't know if that kind of answers your question a little bit, but it's, yeah, check your ego at the door mostly and ask people what they, what they care about because they may be more interested in like their family and family values and preserving their, the integrity of their community and it's on you to try to figure out what that means and to move out of the way if they don't want you there. That's also a huge critical thing. Don't shove your nose in places where it's not appreciated. Um, you got to figure out how to navigate those situations and not from a defensive position or a position of superiority. I think that's the answer I was going to. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. That's all the yeah. time we have. We can keep going forever, but thank you so much. And this is really wonderful, wonderful to have you. This has been recorded, so we'll, we'll post it on our YouTube channel, which... <laughs> But I also, you know, Emily's YouTube channel is also already out there. So please go ahead and uh, check that out. And thank you for coming. Should I stop this? Stop share?